In the last couple of days, more detail has started to leak out about a hair-raising incident over the Black Sea last year. Because it involves three of my favourite topics, Cold War aircraft, interception and air-to-air missiles, I had a few thoughts. If you missed the story, on the 29th of September last year, an RAF RC-135 rivet joint was intercepted by two Su-27 flankers. The rivet joint is a very expensive and important electronic surveillance asset. It carries a crew of around 30, is unarmed, and in this case was unescorted. We already knew that a missile was launched by one of the flankers, supposedly due to a technical issue. In the latest story, it transpires that the intercept was rather amateurishly handled and that two missiles were deliberately launched. In some ways, it is a miracle that NATO and Russia didn't end up in a shooting war. As the Su-27s neared the RC-135, the Russian intercept controller on the ground radioed the pilot with a message to the effect of, you have the target. This is a vague message, but I would have thought that it is most easily interpreted to mean that the flanker pilot had the rivet joint on his radar and could manoeuvre independently to affect the intercept. You would have thought that basic discipline was to clarify an ambiguous order in any case. Instead, the Russian flight leader decided that he had authority to launch an attack on an unarmed NATO aircraft with 30 souls aboard in international airspace. He launched one missile, which didn't hit the RC-135. At this point, his wingman started to yell and swear at his comrade, asking him what the hell he was doing. The leader apparently doubled down on his decision rather than seeking confirmation and attempted to launch a second missile. This one appears to have malfunctioned. The BBC report says that it simply dropped off the rail without igniting. Seemingly, sense then prevailed and the Russian aircraft disengaged. This story is as fascinating as it is frightening. Setting aside the unprofessional nature of the intercept, how did we get so lucky? How did a flanker fire two missiles at an undefended, non-manoeuvring target and score no hits? This is actually something I've covered before in relation to Vietnam and other Cold War engagements. Air-to-air missiles, particularly long-range radar-guided weapons, are extremely complicated. A lot has to go right just to get one off the rail in the first place, let alone to hit a target. Although thus far I've generally spoken about 1950s and 60s aircraft like the F-4 Phantom, F-106 Delta Dart and F-102 Delta Dagger, the principles remain the same with 1980s aircraft like the Su-27 Flanker B. The Flanker B is, after all, the first production version of the Flanker, entering service from about 1982 and becoming operational around 1986. Setting aside its flying characteristics, which are well known, For the time, it was quite advanced in terms of avionics. By the late production models, this suite was based around the Phasertron N1 SWORD Coherent Pulse Doppler Fire Control Radar, which NATO calls Slotback. It has look-down, shoot-down capability. It can detect and track up to 10 targets below the fighter's own level, assigning the two top priority threats amongst those targets and then guiding air-to-air missiles to them. And that's possible even in an electronic countermeasures environment. It also has an optoelectronic sighting system featuring an infrared search and track unit with day and night channels and a laser rangefinder which enables the aircraft to attack covertly. This can be linked to a helmet-mounted sight, but there are plenty of photos showing Russian pilots in this conflict not wearing those. According to the information that was released last October when the incident first came to light, The Su-27 engaged the rivet joint from beyond visual range. The inference is that missiles were launched following a radar lock-on. That suggests that the missiles launched were Vimpel K-27s, codenamed AA-10 Alamo by NATO. The Alamo is a pretty interesting weapon. There are many, many versions of it, but they basically break down to three variants. There are variants on the original R-27R, with semi-active radar homing like a sparrow and a typical range of about 45 miles. This is the standard version of the missile and almost certainly what was used against the rivet joint. Then there are variants on the R-27T with an all-aspect infrared seeker cued by the sighting system for beyond visual range engagement 
range is stated to be up to 40 miles. Finally, there are active homing variants, which tend to get all of the press. These are the R27EA and the EM, with a range of either 80 or 110 miles. When it was first introduced, the inertial guidance on the R27R and the active guidance on the EA and EM gave the flanker quite an advantage over the sparrow-armed F-15s and F-4s in NATO's arsenal. But how many of the advanced versions of the R-27 were actually available isn't really clear. The same is true about the later R-77, referred to as the AA-12 Adder by NATO, which can be carried by some upgraded versions of the flanker. Versions of that missile available to Russian air forces feature ranges beyond 100 miles and some versions have a backup infrared seeker for terminal guidance in high ECM environments. But in the absence of information, it's safest to assume that the flankers were carrying the typical mix of R-27s and R-73s. The R-73 is a shorter ranged infrared missile that NATO refers to as the AA-11 Archer. So let's imagine that we're the flanker pilot. We've been given permission to fire on basically what amounts to an airliner. We decide not to close in to identify the target and then engage with either an IR missile or our gun. This could well be to increase the chance of a kill because the airliner is a big target. The R-27 has a 39 kilogram warhead. The AA-11 only has a 7 kilo one. So we lock the target up and we fire an R-27. How can we miss? Well, things can go wrong from the point at which the missile is first manufactured to the point at which it's fired and then beyond. We have no idea what version of the Alamo we're dealing with here. Given some of the weapons we've seen in the war thus far, it could be a Soviet-built munition, it could have been manufactured in the turmoil of the breakup of the Soviet Union, or sometime thereafter. One way or another, quality control is absolutely critical. One dry solder point or misattached wire could cause a failure. The US learned this lesson in Vietnam and instituted root and branch changes to the way in which missiles were built and handled. And even then, no advanced weapon is manufactured in such a way that 100% of rounds function properly. Which is the next point of failure. Let's assume these rounds were perfectly manufactured. They are then subjected to years perhaps in this case decades, of being moved around, loaded onto and off aircraft, subjected to high G-forces and so on. Even the simple act of putting these things on a truck and moving them about can cause parts to jiggle out of place, solid rocket boosters to crack and so on. A persistent routine of testing, recalibration and maintenance is required to make these weapons work reliably. Hard enough in a professional military, tough in conscript forces, even those with great motivation and high standards. As you can see, even before we load the missile, there's lots of failure points that would not become clear until you press the trigger. But we haven't quite got to that point yet. The other area that has to go right is in the aircraft itself. At the moment of firing, the aircraft systems have to communicate with the missile, in this case via the pylon. There again, there is space for failure, and sometimes those failures are difficult to detect in the normal course of maintenance. You have to go looking for them on an aircraft of the Su-27 era. Once again, that means you need to really care about what you're doing if you're part of the ground crew. And finally, the ground crew have to remember to remove the safeties and the pilot has to do their walk around diligently before takeoff. Assuming all of this has gone right, we now get to pilot skill and preparedness. In a Soviet aircraft of this era, there is a degree of automation, but not to the extent you would see in something like an F-15A or an F-16A. The correct sequence of switches needs to be hit to select the weapon and assign it to the target before firing. Given the wide variety of flavours and therefore launching parameters of Alamos, that might be easier said than done. Once the missile launches, it's tempting to believe that it has perfect accuracy but even a modern missile can get confused by the way the target's radar image changes due to relative movement or even by local weather conditions. In saying all of this, I haven't mentioned any defensive moves by the target, ECM, chaff or active countermeasures. Officially at least, the rivet joint doesn't carry any of these things. It is intended to operate a long way away from any danger. Unofficially, who knows whether it has undisclosed ECM systems.
The best data on the performance of radar-guided missiles comes from the US, who have fired more of them in combat than anyone else. US aviators have also benefited from years of introspection during and after Vietnam to examine and improve performance. The ALT report was just the start. And they have improved. During Rolling Thunder, 340 sparrows were expended for just 27 hits, an 8% effectiveness rate. This improved to 11% in 272 firings during Linebacker. Fast forward to the first Gulf War and effectiveness had jumped sixfold. 34 of 67 rounds hit their targets. That's just a touch over 50% effectiveness. These were weapons being used against fighter-sized targets, but generally not as a result of significant manoeuvring. In most cases, Iraqi aircraft didn't know they were under attack. Forward again, eight years to Operation Allied Force in the Balkans. On March 24, 1999, USF-15Cs fired seven AIM-120 AMRAMs for four MiG-29 kills. A smaller sample size, but an interesting and improved kill ratio of 57%. Given what we've seen about the actual capabilities of Russian weapons in the war so far, I think it is reasonable to say that a 1999 F-15C with early AMRAM is the upper bound of the real capabilities of a mildly upgraded Su-27. The Su-27 is actually a bit of an unknown quantity in some ways. Before the war in Ukraine, it had only been involved in one conflict involving air-to-air -air combat. Ethiopian Su-27s downed two Eritrean MiG-29s in the 1999 conflict between the countries. A third MiG-29 was hit by an unspecified variant of the R-27 and reportedly crashed on landing, although this is disputed. Time will tell what has happened in Ukraine. Another thing worth pointing out, though, is that the Russian Air Force is also an unknown quantity when it comes to air-to-air -to -air tactics and skills. The last time that the Russian and previously Soviet Air Forces were involved in a real battle for air superiority was in Korea. And back then there was a stark difference in ability between veterans of the Great Patriotic War and those trained afterwards. Arab Air Forces trained by the Soviets had a dim view of their instructors, Perhaps that's always what people think of their instructors. In any case, those of us in the public domain just don't know anything much about how prepared the average flanker pilot is to launch a live round in combat. But all that said, the Rivet Joint crew were definitely lucky. One of the rounds, the second, either suffered a motor failure or a communication failure with the aircraft and just fell off into the sea. As for the first round, it could be something wrong with the weapon, as I described earlier or the pilot hit the wrong combinations of switches and the missile didn't get the right guidance from the flanker. What we can probably conclude is that although fighters serving today and the missiles they carry have extraordinary capabilities, they are far from perfect. The same issues of technology, manufacturing quality, handling, aircraft preparation and pilot skill exist even if some problems have been ironed out. So when we look at potential adversaries, or the on-paper capabilities of weapons, we have to remember that the perfect shot rarely happens in the real world. And in this case, we need to be very thankful about that fact.